Let us uh, go ahead and proceed. There he is. We all ready? All right. Good to see you guys. How you been? All right. Do I have a ticket yet? Not yet. <laughs> How much is a parking ticket in Cincinnati? I was asked that. Fifty bucks. Yeah, about fifty dollars. Depending, yeah. depending on where you park. Sometimes there's uh, oh, so, yeah. and the state limits them because they're going to. You guys these. already have these. Everybody's yeah, got the state. Yeah. Yeah. Amy's got. I'm already giving you down for you. Man, keep going. Keep going. <laughs> Doctor Frame, what would I do without you? Roll. Let's roll. Mm -hmm. Ready? Yeah, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as you probably already know, my name is Chris Neighbors. This is Timothy Russell and Andrew McDarty. And uh, for our Capstone uh, presentation, we did P Plus Street Parking. Our sponsor, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Kastner, and our teacher, Dr. Houston. Uh, so an overview, here's what we'll be going over. We'll go over the background of our project, the objectives, timeline, system breakdown, codes and standards, constraints, hardware and software, fixture, cost, future work, and references. And here is the background right now. My sister got a parking ticket on campus and my friends and I were discussing how hard it is to find parking in Clifton. So we decided to set out to make parking smarter. Using an Arduino microcontroller and an HC SRO4 ultrasonic sensor, what we're doing is taking displacement readings in front of the parking space and pushing that information in real time to Google Firebase, which updates our web app. This technology can be applied to other areas in parking, like parking garages and outdoor, other outdoor parking spaces. It can also be applied to inventory management, such as counting packages, making sure your store shelf is stocked. And lastly, it can also be applied to different measures of quality control. So it gives you a brief background of what we're dealing with with the start of this project. Okay. Our objective with this project was to create a device that we could add on to a parking meter that would, in real time, relay information about whether or not that spot is taken to the internet. So anyone, anywhere in the world, could find out if that spot's open. Ultimately, we would like it to be more so integrated into like a Google Maps or some kind of directions-based application that would allow you to find parking close to a location that you want to go to that would update in real time if it gets taken and redirect you to a different spot. All right, let's go through the demo. You want to flip over to the website? Okay, so we're, here is our car or vehicle simulator. Um, so what we have is we have three lights and we have three flags that show up on the map. Green uh, indicates an open space. Yellow means someone is either pulling in or pulling out, and red means occupied. So when we go about two feet from the parking sensor, this should trip to a yellow flag. Then once you have the car occupying the spot and parked, it should flip to a yellow or a red flag, indicating that the spot has been taken. So, in. Uh explicit quality we have our timeline of uh, kind of what we did over our 18 weeks what we started off was we had to come up with a concrete idea of what we were doing there's a lot of ways we could take this project so we wanted to narrow it down to something that was doable for a completed project in 18 weeks so as you can see in our first period of December to January is a lot of planning and a lot of initial uh, playing with the the hardware trying to figure out the Arduino make it work in the ways we wanted to and then later coming back and making sure the software integrated with it so we can make it uh, communicate with uh, with the website. All right, so like Chris said, um, we set out on this project and we had our target, we knew what we wanted to do, and then we were trying to spend most of our time figuring out what we could actually complete in those 18 weeks. Um, none of us are computer science majors. We didn't have any computer science majors working with us, so it was up to all three of us to learn uh, JavaScript, mobile app development, database, real-time development, um, and also working with uh, Internet of Things devices like this. So with the application, these were the initial targets and this was kind of our 
first take of what we wanted the application to do. So in a nutshell, we imagine you have an app, you download it to your phone, Android or iPhone, you log in, create an account. Um, that account information is stored in the cloud. What we do is we take your location from your phone uh, with the GPS associated with that phone and then you put in your destination to this application. From there, the app is going to sweep around that area in like a half mile, uh, have that also change like the radius from how far you're willing to walk to your destination, have it look for open street parking. At that point, you could reserve that spot and say, hey, I'm on my way to go like a quarter mile down from Bakersfield down in OTR, let's say. You arrive at the parking spot, claim the spot, have a code show up on your phone, type it into your meter, you're all good to go and you're paid, ready to rock. Okay. Codes and standards that we found to be applicable to what we were working with. Um, we plan to use uh, Wi-Fi or wireless uh, local area networks. So there is a IEEE standard for that. Um, it didn't necessarily pertain to how, I'm trying to think how to phrase this, uh, it wasn't necessarily something that we had to look at extensively, but it does pertain to the way the devices worked. So we wanted to make sure to add that in there. Uh, the standard method from ASTM for how to calibrate a sonar sensor was useful in how we actually set ours up and then made sure that it was working properly and outputting data exactly as it should. Then in steps to come, we will end up working with uh, standards on like weatherproofing. Uh, there's a standard for sealing joints, which will be necessary since this is an electronic device built to uh, sit outside year round. All right, so some of the constraints that we were working with, economic <coughs> first of all, we wanted to keep the cost of each unit as low as possible because in order to uproot and change the current, way, the current method of looking for street parking, to sell this to a business owner or to the municipalities, they're going to want the lowest initial investment to get this thing off the ground. Next, moving into environmental, um, our housings for the, the initial design for the housing is made out of recycled plastics and 3D printed. Um, also, the microcontroller and sensor selected require a relatively small amount of energy to run. So you're working between power, your power source can be anywhere between six to 12 volts, and then I think upwards of 50 milliamps and at least 20 milliamps. Um, moving on to sustainability, Again, the parking sensor itself is efficient on low amount of energy, so moving forward with this, we're thinking also about incorporating a solar panel to power the system with a rechargeable battery. Manufacturability, what we're looking for when we set out to pick each of the components for this parking sensor, we want to make sure that they were readily available for multiple um, retailers. So if something were to break, it'd be easily replaced at a low cost to us. Um, Ethical, we have illegal parking, so if you are planning on uh, running in and out of a store and parking legally, well, we're, that, it's like, it was interesting, I was like telling this to somebody, I think it was your dad, when we were talking about it, and he's like, wait, so you mean if I park somewhere, run in and run out, I'm going to get a ticket automatically? And we're like, yeah, kind of, so there's a little bit of an issue there. Um, the other big thing that we're working with and trying to figure out is making sure that the driver has their destination set before they start driving and operating the vehicle because you don't want somebody looking at their phone and driving down Vine Street. Um, health and safety also kind of plays into that. The distracted driving is a big hurdle that we want to make sure that, you know, obviously nobody's distracted while operating their vehicle. So our hardware and software, for software we had a culmination of uh, different technologies and some new concepts for us learning as mechanical engineers. First of which, the application and the hardware that we're running is all in JavaScript, the ECMA script 6, another word for JavaScript. Um, we're also using Node.js, which is an application program interface. Um, NPM is associated with Node.js, that is a package manager, so what that is, it's a large open source library, so when you have all of these JavaScript developers coming up with different solutions to problems, what they do is they upload that to um, NPM so other people can use it and solve similar issues. Um, Johnny5 is the IoT platform that we're using, so you use Node.js, JavaScript, and Johnny5 to actually program the hardware. I worked 
mostly with the uh, Google Firebase side of this project. What Google Firebase is, is actually a cloud database that allowed us to push information into a cloud and then store it associated with a specific spot. And it also made it easier for us to create a web application, the web application that was able to access this information constantly and notice any time that there was a change in said information. So that's how we actually trigger the map to change which spots are open and which ones aren't. It was using Firebase. Hardware. All right, and then, yeah, the hardware, right now we uh, decided to use an Arduino Uno. Hindsight 2020, it's way more sophisticated and way more powerful than what we really need. We need one output, in, uh, or one output, two inputs, and then this is a fully functioning meter. So moving forward, if we were to scale this up and go into mass production with it, we would obviously try to find a vendor that could uh, satisfy our needs for a future project. And then also the HCSR04 ultrasonic sensor is what we're using to, de to detect if there is a car in front of that spot. Okay. Here you can see two design variations that we came up with for our fixture. Uh, you can kind of tell which one we ended up choosing in the end. Uh, what we went about doing was Chris came up with the design and then I also came up with the design and we came back and kind of compared the two to see which one met our needs the best. You can see our design matrix up here. Uh, the first design being the one in red came out mostly with fives and fours being good to the best that we could come up with for what we're working with now. Um, the only issue may be like the way we're fitting it to a hole. I think that there is room for improvement there. So, but yeah, that's uh, the designs that we chose. And for cost, so uh, what a lot of people were impressed with at the showcase was the entire cost for the project was $50.40. Um, the, the cost could be scaled down a lot too. So the Arduino microcontroller we were using, we started off with the same package you would get like your niece or nephew for their birthday to play around with. So there's a lot of extra components and things there that we don't actually need. So if we were going into mass production, you're trying to, you'd speak with the retailer, say, here's how many units we need, what cost can you do this? And then looking for the, uh, the range detector, uh, VOD distance sensor, that was already pretty cheap. And uh, the sensor is not very sophisticated, so looking forward, we would definitely use a different type of sensor um, in the future, but hopefully stay around that same price range. And then lastly, the recycled material, uh, it's a 2.2 pound spool of it, and we, we may be used a dollar to two dollars worth of it, but you know, if, if you're a if you're a manufacturing plant, you don't just order the amount you need; you order the quantity the retailer sells to you. So we added that into our cost as well. Okay, looking forward, we would like to create a better housing that is even more weatherproof. Uh, the one that we have here has some uh, gaps in it that would allow water to potentially get through. We would also add in a battery and close off the bottom edge of this which we left open simply for prototyping purposes. We wanted to interact with the computer in real time and be able to keep a closer eye on what's going on inside the unit. So we close everything up, add in a battery, and potentially add a solar unit on top, uh, depending on what we see fit there. We would also, as Tim mentioned, probably end up using a different board, uh, find a board that more well suits our needs specifically, maybe smaller, maybe larger, so it would require further design iteration at that point. Also, we wanted to add Wi-Fi capacity to this unit. The interesting thing was, I saw in the news, I think it was March, like three weeks ago, about March 20th, 21st, Cincinnati, the city of Cincinnati actually stated that they will be trying to provide Wi-Fi for the entire city, which is great for an application like this. One of the biggest questions that we got at the senior showcase was, how are you gonna connect this wirelessly? Are you gonna use Wi-Fi? Because that can get spotty. Are you gonna use Bluetooth? Are you gonna try to use uh, cellular, LTE, 3G, 4G type deal. So hopefully that comes through and also hopefully we continue this project and get to see that uh, work all the way through. Moving forward as well, um, this is a two part. Uh, there are two groups that would benefit, or three groups that would benefit from something like this. First of all, being the municipalities. So let's say you have two drivers. You have driver A and driver B. Driver A pulls up to a parking space, buys a 30 minute, time slot. Only uses 10 minutes of it, leaves the spot. Driver B comes up, takes that same spot, and also 
buys a 30 minute time slot. The municipalities get a double charge for 20 minutes of that time for that spot being used. Also, you could issue parking tickets, so if you see that there is a parking space that is obviously fraudulent or hasn't been updated for pay, you can send out your uh, parking meter officer and issue a ticket like that. Or you could issue electronically, if we were to go forward and install a camera and take a picture of the license plate on the vehicle, you could just issue it electronically and then you wouldn't need to have anybody go out to each individual car. Um, so secondly, also this would help the user. Um, I know for a fact one of the biggest deterrents for me going down to any urban area is looking for affordable parking or even just looking for street parking. It wasn't just but a couple of weeks ago we were trying to go downtown, like I said, we were going to Bakersfield. We spent 45 minutes looking for street parking. So thirdly, that would also help your uh, business owner down in that urban environment. The more people that can access parking and then come into your store, there's more business that you can have. Also, something like this would be really great because you could track your uh, traffic data and then give it back to these business owners and say, hey, these are your busiest hours, and then they can properly staff their uh, company. And then uh, for the reserve pay park, we're also looking at reserving uh, options for this. So well, moving forward, what we'd like to do with the web app is where you have that, that carrot that tells you if the parking spot is taken or open. When the spot is taken, you'll be able to log into your own thing and pay for it. So let's say you're, you're, whatever you're doing is taking too long. Instead of risking that extra 10 minutes, you know you're gonna go over and possibly getting a ticket, even though nine times out of 10, you'll probably be safe that 10th time, you know, you're looking at a $50 ticket. Every person I know is gonna pay that extra quarter, you know, 25 cents, you put it on your phone, you get an extra 15, 20 minutes. And that, uh, that time that you're paying for, the city is getting rest before, nine times out of 10, people are just risking and not paying that, you know, not paying that extra money and going back to the meter. Uh, and reserving parking would help in that same way. If you're running late, you know exactly where you need to go, you know where it would be, you know, you find a spot that's open, you reserve that spot. Um, inventory management. We're all mechanical engineers here. Uh, I specifically, a lot of my uh, experience has been in manufacturing and where we all thought this would be help a lot is in stores inventory management. So a lot of these places have uh, stores areas where you keep a lot of parts. And like at all three of the places I work at now, they're tiny parts and there's hundreds of thousands of them. So if you have sensors in front of your, sh your store shelving and you have a guy with an iPad that keeps track of that, you have, at, you have complete situational awareness of how many parts, where they're at, what shelf, and what part of stores at all time. It could be in a 3D CAD model where you click on the shelf and you open it up to see how many parts you have and you have complete control of the process. Um, AI integration into parking sensors. So uh, that's artificial intelligence. We were looking at uh, some articles and application to this. Google's working with Raspberry Pi, which is another microcontroller application. And essentially what you're doing is, if you've seen in quality control processes where you have a camera that can identify problems with your part or fixture, in the same way that's being applied to a microcontroller, that identifies whether there is a car in a space or not. And where that expands to in the future is you have one pole that controls a 30-foot span. And as long as people have your, your application or paying for that parking, you only need that one pole for that 30 feet. Uh, so for our references, special thanks to our sponsor, Dr. Jeffrey Kastner, uh, for his leadership and counsel, and also a uh, special thanks to uh, Dale Hall's house. It's uh, one of Tim's buddies from the gym, really helped us with some of the software uh, kinks that we ran into. And then uh, here are some of the other references that uh, we used for the completion of our project. In summary, uh, we covered our background, we covered our objectives, timeline, system breakdown, code standards, constraints, hardware and software, fixture costing, future work, and references. Do you all have any questions? Dr. Houston, please. Yeah. Couple, couple things here. Um, how robust is this? In other words, uh, suppose I, I bump this with the, the mirror on my car because I'm not a good driver. So, as Andrew McDarty talked about before, our future work, we have three big ticket items to do first. First of all, get Wi-Fi working, get rid of this cord. The second one, get the battery and solar cell working into it. And the third part,